This is, this is maybe one of the most fun sessions of the whole uh, weekend, in part because we're talking about um, this state's civic religion, uh, football, uh, and also because we're joined by a, a murderer's row of thinkers and writers and just general blowhards, if we're being honest. Uh, I mean, not since Bear Bryant dined alone has there been such an array of, of horsepower here when it comes to football in the South. Um, and so this is a real treat. Uh, before we start, I just want to say, uh, one of the fellows on this uh, stage has a, a recent book about football and really life in New Orleans, this great city that some of us get to call home. Um, it's Kent Babb, who is a fantastic sports writer for the Washington Post. It's called Across the River, and it's a year in the life of the Edna Carr football team in 2019. And it's not just about football. In fact, it reminds me of the old saw that um, Moby Dick uh, was not just a book about a whale. And in the same vein, this is not a book about football. It's a book about New Orleans and about life uh, on the West Bank, and I would urge you all to buy that book today if you have not uh, read it. You won't be able to put it down. Um, so that's my plug for, for Kent and his great book. Um, we're talking about football in the South, which if you're here, you obviously care about, know about, and love. And I thought that we'd sort of try to do this conversation uh, in a way that, that breaks down the topic and sort of captures the, the three stations of the cross, if you will, when it comes to football in the South. High school ball, college football and professional football, because all three have an immense following in different parts of the South, but obviously all three are, are very different. Um, and I guess we can, we can start here with Kent and talk about high school, because that's obviously the topic of, of his book. I guess, Kent, just first of all, tell us about your experience covering high school football in New Orleans and broad, more broadly in Louisiana, because you were up to Monroe for the state playoffs, too. So you were in North and South Louisiana, which folks in this room know are two very different places. Um, uh, I, think, I, I think dancing is now legal up in North Louisiana. I'm not sure about that. But I think it's, it's been recently made legal. Uh, and like some, you know, like near beer, I think you can get, too. Um, anyways, tell us about high school ball, why it's so important in New Orleans and other parts of Louisiana like Monroe. Well, there's, there's a sort of old saying that if you want to see America, you look at a football locker room, and it's people that have to be sort of clustered together, and they have to get along. They have to pull the same direction, and high school football is obviously the most accessible uh, for many of us who don't have uh, spectacular talent, and so a lot of kids in this state want to play. They grow up wanting to play, not just to play, but to learn discipline, to be part of something big. And the school and those like it, like the one that I wrote about uh, in Algiers, I mean, quite literally right across the river from the French Quarter, <clears throat> these kids face death almost regularly. I mean, these are kids who just sort of get used to their friends being shot and killed. Um, some, and one of the young men, the first young man that I wrote about uh, in the story in the Washington Post that inspired the book, uh, he, when he would go to a family reunion, he was almost always the only male there between the ages of 16 and 50. Um, and it's just something that happens. Uh, so football, yes, is popular, it's fun, it's problematic in some ways, um, but it's a gateway drug to discipline and success for a lot of kids who otherwise don't have it. And talk about some of the rivalries within the city and the kind of traditions at these schools because attachment to high school in New Orleans, as folks who are from the city know, where you went to high school in the city matters a lot. I, mean, I don't know how many times, I'm not from here, my wife is, but I can recall coming down here for the, the first few times and the question is always asked, where'd you go to school in New Orleans? And nobody means where you went to college. They mean where'd you go to high school, right? And that's in the white community and black community alike, right? It's, it, tell us about those high school attachments, whether it's Uptown, Newman, and, and Jesuit, or places like Warren Easton and Carr. It, it's, it's who you are. I mean, it, it's like if, if you're from here, where you went to high school tells you a lot about who you are, what your identity is, <clears throat> what your background is, what your family is like, uh, where you're headed, where you've been. Um, and there's very interesting collisions on the football field here, and I write about it quite a bit. Um, and when John Curtis, which is predominantly white, it's a Christian school, uh, JT Curtis is famous, he's one of the winningest coaches 
in the nation. They win every year. Uh, he forbids profanity, you know, like it's very strict. Uh, if, if a player says a curse word, he gets pulled off the field. So he does, he's not allowed to play that day. Uh, at Carr, which is 99% black, when I uh, reported the book, uh, it was 100% black, coaching staff and player roster. Um, and it's almost like cursing is an art form. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just something that you, you get used to and it's very harsh. And, you know, the coaches there would say, you know, you have to speak the language of the kids. If you try to speak above them, they're going to tune you out. And these are some kids that have been through some serious trauma. So you can't immediately, like Coach Bryce Brown, who's the main character of the book and the head coach over there, he's this fascinating 400-pound genius who not only knows how to coach football, um, but just he, he's the best people manager I've ever been around. And he just knows how to get into these kids' minds, and he's a behavioral psychologist, um, treats himself terribly. But anyway, he says you have to reach them before you can teach them. And so you have to identify and bond with these young people uh, before they listen to you, and that makes a lot of sense. James, I want to ask you about college football next, but you can't talk about college football in the South without first alluding to professional football, because you and Kent, I think, are a few years different in age. <laughs> Not that many. Uh, but I, when Kent was growing up in the upstate of South Carolina, and when you were growing up in South Louisiana, different periods, you, you both had in common something. Neither of your states had yet pro football teams. Uh, there was no New Orleans Saints when you were growing up in Carville, Louisiana. There was no Carolina Panthers when you were growing up in the upstate Kent. So, James, how important is, is that in sort of explaining the devotion to college football in the South? You just didn't have pro teams here until the 70s, right? Right. Well, it, it was. You know, like we say in Louisiana, the, the great five Fs of Louisiana, faith, family, food, football, and fixing flats. Uh, <laughs> Fixing flats? <laughs> Fixing flats. <laughs> I, I, I want to point out something just culturally about football in Louisiana. You see the great John Barry, the eminent historian of the 1918 flu and the 1927 flood, was an assistant coach on a Tulane team that beat LSU in 1973. <laughs> it's the biggest night that Tulane athletics has had in its entire history. <laughs> so you're right. One of the other things about not having pro sports the PQM used to cover high school sports like, like you would not believe. All right, I mean, if, if you had the, the, the Jesuit Holy Cross game or, you know, anything like that, I mean, it Pancha was all... Uh, versus right, right. a meet, yeah. And so when the Saints came, I was in the Marine Corps, and I was sitting in a bar watching them play the Los Angeles Rams. Was it Fleet Roberts or John? Who was it? He went coast to coast. Yeah, no, it was uh, John Gillum. John Gillum. The first play in the history of the New Orleans Saints was a 99-yard kickoff return. And the, the, the ensuing years were not that good, but at, at any rate, yes. But you were a grown man at that point. Huh? So, but you were a grown man at that point when football came to New yeah, Orleans. Was, I was 22 years old. Right. So f football for you growing up was two things. It was high school and LSU. Right. Yeah. And, and LSU was everything. Yeah. I mean, I... I for the 58, for the, when Billy Cannon made his run back, the seats that I sat in, my sister and brother-in-law sit in those seats today. All right, that, that's how deep the tentacles of LSU football are in the culture. Right. I mean, it's, you can't imagine it, you know. Um, and if you went to every parish in this state outside of Orleans, LSU would be king. Right? The big thing that happened, right, first of all, LSU had no connection to the black community. Right. For good reason. I mean, but, but black people just didn't have any affinity because, for, 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 for good reason. And they didn't have much of a following in New Orleans. It, you know, some, but it wasn't. That. And I, I, I give, you know, Nick Saban a lot of credit. Yeah. You know, in really, like, identifying. And now, I mean, if you go, the, the cultural difference between the Saints game and the LSU game is still, it's, been, it's just a Immense. cultural difference. Yes, it's, it's, it, it's momentous, but it's not near as big as it used to be. And that, that's been a big story yeah. of, of LSU football over the years. Yeah, because you, you kind of have parallel tracks in the South. You had, obviously, these legendary figures like 
like Bear Bryant, but at the same time you had schools like Grambling um, and, uh, and Southern who had iconic coaches and programs of their own, right? Yeah, well, you know, Eddie Robinson. Right. Yeah, I don't know how many people. And, and actually, the, the integration at LSU got better, Grambling, you know. Yeah. It, it, it's just one of these things that, you know, if you will, evolved, in, and I think in a, in a better way over a period of time. But if I'm probably a Grambling alum, I, I, I don't think it's so great. <laughs> um, Jeff, you, you're from a basketball state originally. You grew up in, in Kentucky. I should note uh, pulling for U of L and the Cardinals, not – the, the, the folks in blue, which I, no. is a very sensitive topic for, for Jeff. But you came down here and have obviously been sort of dominating the sports coverage in New Orleans for, for a couple of decades now. And I uh, hope folks in this room all read Jeff's columns in the Picayune um, each week. Uh, you just try to explain to us h- how you approach this, because you obviously spent a lot of time covering the Saints. You've written great books about the Saints, but you also understand that uh, on Saturdays, and for for a lot of other people uh, in the state, seven days a week, college football is still king. Like, what what's your experience with with sort of readers and your interaction college versus pro here? Well, my my first year at the Picayune was 1999, and I uh, came down to cover Jerry Donardo's. You'll remember that forlorn season, their last his last season as LSU's football coach. So I lived in Baton Rouge, and we ended up breaking myself and my colleague. Josh Peter broke the story when Nick Saban was hired to replace Jerry DiNardo. And I'll never forget that uh, front page. It was back when you could break a story on the front page of a newspaper the next day. That's how long ago that was. And we, I remember the headline was $1.3 million. And Pete Finney, my longtime mentor at the paper, was just aghast that LSU would pay $1.3 million. Now they pay their coordinators right. more than that. That's quaint. Yeah. So that shows you just how important football is. And I learned quickly that year, that year, nobody really cared about basketball. Where I'd come from in Louisville, Kentucky, basketball was king. Uh, down here, spring football, the joke is, is bigger uh, than basketball. And it's, I don't think it's too far off. Well, and, and speaking of basketball, we have breaking news today. And I think your, your paper tomorrow here, We'll probably have this on page one. LSU has fired their basketball coach, Will Wade, uh, uh, amid um, uh, intensifying uh, investigations from the NCAA. So LSU is going to have an interim coach here uh, as they go into the NCAA tournament, which will make life interesting. And uh, LSU is apparently next year going to have a new football and basketball coach. So that will make things interesting. And uh, Scott Woodward's busy. He's going to be a very busy a very busy man indeed. I, I hope he makes it to Moscow tonight with us. No, no <laughs> yeah, he could be. He could well, be. Look, I'd say this. You know, you were talking earlier about this, James. I think you would agree. You know, the SEC motto that has kind of become a, a joke unto itself now, it, it just means more, right? Right. I, I think that's very true of Louisiana, whether it's high school, like what Kent went through covering Carr or LSU. I and mean, we have 12 Division One universities in this state that play football. I mean, that's insane. Uh, you know, the state of Arizona has three. Imagine how, how big that state is. And I see it with the New Orleans Saints. You know, when I moved down here, I had no idea the Saints were as popular, as wildly, had this wildly passionate following that they had. I knew about the Green Bay Packers and the Pittsburgh Steelers, some of these uh, kind of institutional, traditional right. franchises. I had no idea that people lined up at Lee Circle back in 1967 to buy tickets two miles long. So this passion has been around forever. Uh, Dave, and, and, back in their forefathers, you know, Dave Dixon. And, and probably the most unifying institution in all of New Orleans, right? I mean, ac- across every right. conceivable divide, uh, the Saints bring folks together. Um, Mardi Gras and, and, and Saints. Mardi Gras game. and the Saints, yeah. Uh, even yeah. the Mardi Gras, obviously, uh, different neighborhords you have uh, very and different alcohol. parties, uh, it's, 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 it's very different uh, outfits as well, shall we say. Um, James, I want to ask you about politics, uh, which obviously is what you and I spend a lot of time talking about when we aren't talking about sports, um, about politics and football. Uh, I was here in 2019 covering the Governor Edwards' re-election campaign, and I, I vividly recall he was doing a, a stop, I think Tyler was there actually, at a place in the Bywater uh, called B Studios. Studio B, thank you. And I asked him a question. I, was kind of, I think I was half joking, but he answered in a pretty earnest way. I said, 
because he obviously is a big fan himself of, of LSU. And of course, that was the magical Joe Burrow year. And I, we were probably at this point in November, so he was in the runoff. And so we, we were deep into that, that campaign and deep into that, that magical run for Joe Burrow and LSU. And I said, Governor, I, you know, can you get like Coach Oda, maybe, I don't know, like cut you a, a campaign spot or sort of help the cause here uh, in the runoff? And what he said to me was, you know, the, your joke, but actually, when people are happy in Louisiana because LSU is winning in football, they're generally happy with who's in charge of the government, too, because they're in a good mood. <laughs> and, like, they're feeling upbeat about the state of affairs because LSU is winning every Saturday. And therefore, like, they're, they're happy campers. And so, like, the state and things are on the right track. He wasn't kidding. I mean, yeah. how much do you think John Bell was helped in a really close race in 2019 by saying, you know, good times are here, right? Like, what's, what's not to love? I actually think, you know, he's a starting quarterback at Amy Todd. Yeah. So he he, play, he did play college football. By the way, this book is unbelievable, and 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 you're right, Jonathan. It's it's like I'm saying that it, it's way about way more than football. Yeah. And it's really about culture. And most people in here think they understand. You don't understand what these kids go through. I promise you. I don't care how empathetic you are. I don't care how tolerant you are. You have no idea what these children go through every day. And you ought to read it if you live here, because it really is yeah. a eye awakening. I think social commentary as much as anything else, and I mean that. And I read the book. Well, I'm going to put that on the paperback blurb, James. <laughs> I mean, feel it's free a, to do it. But, it's a book about New Orleans, and if you care about New Orleans, you should definitely read the book. Tell us, Ken, about your experience, though, with traveling mm -hmm. with this team, because I recall the, the opening scene in the book. You, you're growing up north with this team, and uh, folks who are from here know this. But you go north of I-10 in Louisiana; it's a very different state. Uh, it's a very different style for a lot of reasons. So tell us about that. It's sort of almost an entirely black high school football team. You were often the only white guy in the locker room, with the exception of maybe one coach. So tell us about that, going to North Louisiana and, and traveling with you know, black young men and sort of going to a, a very different region. Went to Monroe with the car team twice. And the first time, I always sat with... Uh, there's this, he, he's a coach, but he's not really a coach. You know, he's sort of, the, we call it the get back coach. So he just sort of likes to hang around. Um, and he's sort of the comic relief of the team, Coach Marv. And I always sat beside him because he liked to talk trash. And so do I. And um, we were, we had just crossed into Mississippi and he starts, and we're all kind of like dozing off. And he starts sort of shuffling like in his chair and he's getting very annoyed. And I'm like, what's going on? And he's like, there's a effing cotton field out here. I didn't expect to see that. And I was like, oh, yeah, weird. You know, that's just something you don't see every day. So, you know, it's one of those things where I almost didn't ask about it because it felt like a cultural taboo. And I was like, well, Marv, why don't you tell me what that means? You know, why, why, why are you that upset just seeing the cotton field? And, you know, he, he was just like, my grandmother worked in a field like that as a sharecropper. And I always... It, my mom had to sit at the back of the bus when we were growing up. He had been called terrible things uh, as, as one of the first uh, black students at Edna Carr uh, back in the 60s. And um, I'm really glad I asked about that because it helped me to sort of understand this person's perspective. And it's just not something that I thought about in that way. Um, and it almost, it almost ruined his day uh, because of that. But the, the second time we went, there was a, a playoff game at Neville High School in Monroe, and that's predominantly white. And the way, and this is like later in the book, but the way I wrote that chapter is that <clears throat> the people at Carr don't know what to expect when they get to Monroe. And the people in Monroe don't know what to expect when this, when this team from the West Bank of New Orleans gets there and they're, they're both kind of nervous about it. They don't really know what's coming. And so they're, they, they lean on stereotypes because they don't know. And so they're like, well, the car team is going to be fast and strong uh, and athletic. And the white team, the Neville team, is going to be well coached. And that's obviously BS. But that's, that's just what the stereotypes lead football fans and even players and coaches to believe. And you get up there and you, you realize everybody's well coached, everybody's athletic, everybody's fast and strong. And then who wins? And it was, it was just sort of like this expectations buster, you know, not just for the two teams, but, but definitely for me. So some people here know this, but um, 
we in New Orleans are about to witness one of the most extraordinary football recruiting stories uh, in modern history because this fall is going to be the senior year of Arch Manning here uh, a few blocks away at, at the Newman School. Um, as you guys probably know, if you're here for a football a seminar, uh, Arch Newman is the grandson of Archie Manning and obviously the nephew of, um, of Peyton and Eli Manning. And uh, he is the top recruit uh, in America. He is being targeted by every major program. Jeff, just sort of take us inside what this recruitment is like, what's it like for his family, uh, his grandfather, his uncles, uh, his dad, Cooper, who was no slouch himself, played a receiver for Ole Miss. Uh, tell us about this recruitment and these various Southern powerhouses and these coaches who were coming to this small uptown New Orleans campus and showing up at basketball games in like high school gyms uh, who were larger than life figures to recruit a 17 year old or a 16 year old kid. And just like, bring us inside this. It's a remarkable story. Uh, it's extraordinary. I don't think we've seen anything like this. You got to remember when, when Eli and Peyton came up, we didn't have the advent of you know the proliferation of social media, and I think that's helped. It's obviously helped Arch having uh, uncles, a grandfather that know the pressure, know the extraordinary amount of uh, hype that's going to be built around this young man. I have to say he's he's handled it incredibly well. Uh, but I think he's been prepared. I think his grandfather, uh, Charles Heidenfelder, uh, den local dentist in town, uh, said it best. He said, Arch has been programmed mm. to play quarterback. And I think that's perfectly, perfectly put. Um, it's extraordinary. I mean, uh, Nick Saban flew in for a, a basketball game that Arch played. He's playing basketball, which I think is fascinating that on, in one sport he's the – you know, the number one player and in the entire day, country. Right? This is a rare thing now. Right, and he's playing basketball where he's basically the glue guy, role player, never gets the ball, never does anything special. Uh, and, and he has to switch those hats, right, and know his role between the two sports. I, I think that's very interesting that he has that humble mindset to still want to be a contributor in another sport. It says, says a lot about him. Look, he, he still hasn't decided yet. I mean, he probably will announce today and make me look bad, but uh, as far as I know... Speaking of breaking news... Yeah. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, he's, he's pretty wide open. I think they want to wait and really see how the shifting sands yeah. of college football play out. Yeah. They don't want to make a, a mistake, and they're very calculating. If you know the Manning family, and I know you, you've had uh, experiences with them as well, I mean, they're not going to rush into this. Uh, it, they know what's at stake here. Now, this kid, I think, is going to play in the NFL if he went to Delgado. You know, he's that good. <laughs> it doesn't really matter where he goes, but, but, but Archie and, and Cooper and Ellen, they want him to enjoy the experience of college. It means a lot to them. But he'll stay in the South, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so like, it, it wouldn't shock me if he went to Virginia, yeah. uh, where his sister is going right now. It wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me at all. Uh, because he, he's going to make it in the NFL wherever he, wherever he goes. I'm just glad he's not going to Clemson. I, I, I went he's to definitely South not Carolina. going to. He has ruled out Clemson. <laughs> yes. but, but guys, and That's Jay, a victory. J James, jump in here. Uh, give us his top three and, and where you guys. Out of it. What's you know, that? We're not out of it. That was just a last shot. I don't think. That in, in 2000, August 2019, so Olivia apparently sent Archie to get a car washed at the Chapatula's car wash, and Mary sent me to get her car washed, so I ran into her. Yeah. And it just finished the passing camp. And I said, Varsity, what, what do you think about Joe Burr? And he said, James, he can play, and more importantly, he knows he can play. I left there and I said, you know, we're going to be pretty goddamn good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, you know, that's what he, you know. The Manning Passing Camp is the uh, annual summer event down in Thibodeau that the Mannings host for um, uh, uh, the high school kids um, and obviously has, has college players come as the counselors, I, I, I think. Um, so, um, James, are you think uh, 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 LSU is still in the game, but potentially Bama and Georgia, too? The LSU what now? LSU, Bama, and Georgia, we think, for, for Arch? I don't know. I, he listed six schools yeah. or something, but it, it, he's a junior in high school. Yeah, yeah. All right? I mean, the Sands are, we, we got to, for everything he is and his pedigree and, and everything yeah. else, you yeah. know, he's 16, 17 years old. Yeah. And, but I mean, but these coaches recruiting him, they all know they can't step over the line there. I mean, they, they know the Manning name, the brand, 
And so they're very, very careful. It's a totally different so, recruitment. Remember when Eli said, I'm not, Archie said he's not playing in San Diego, right? They're just like, they helped in elf draft. I waited out, and then, of course, they traded him to the Giants where he won two Super Bowls. Right. I mean, they're, they're not demanding for, for anything they are. They're, um, A, smart, and B, pragmatic. So I, I promise you that I am not taking money from the Louisiana tourism industry when I say this. But, Jeff, can you recall a, a, a year as the fall of 2022 is going to be where there's more anticipation in Louisiana football than going to this fall. The number one recruit in the country playing here at Newman, it will have every major coach going to most of his games uh, coming into this city this fall. Uh, it's gonna be a page one story when he does sign. LSU with a new coach, Brian Kelly from Notre Dame, uh, who's still working on his accent, uh, <laughs> uh, but has got a pretty good recruiting class uh, coming in. Um, but obviously he's trying to adapt to the South. And James is going to note here that other Midwesterners have done well uh, uh, at LSU, including a guy named Nick Saban. Um, so new coach at LSU, and then new coach uh, with the Saints. So three extraordinary storylines. This is going to sell a lot of papers, I think, uh, this fall. But um, can you recall a sort of moment where there was this much sort of pregnant uncertainty about uh, uh, a football here? Well, there's, yeah, there's going to be obviously curiosity uh, with all the all these programs and all these storylines, and uh, but I think it, it all comes down, Jonathan, to winning yeah. more than anything else. I mean, LSU's got to get back on track. That's why they hire a new coach. That's why Coach O's out. Yeah. And uh, I think Brian Kelly will do extremely well. I think he's already doing very well. I don't know as much. I'm not as confident about the Saints' chances. You know, yeah. I, I have a crude analogy for being a sports writer, especially in the South. Uh, I compare us, compare us to meteorologists, except there's one big exception. Everybody wants us to tell them it's going to be sunny and 70 every day. Nobody wants you to tell them the truth that it's going to rain this year for the Saints. It might rain. Uh, that's the difference. I think it might rain on the Saints this year with all the transition, with the lack of quarterback. Um, so I hate to be the bearer of bad news. And don't forget, by the way, that Brian Kelly will make his debut here in New Orleans because LSU Florida opens State. Correct. at the Superdome Labor Day weekend against uh, Florida State. Uh, so that'll be uh, a big event here. Uh, that'll, be, that'll be fun to watch. We talked a lot about Louisiana. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But let's talk about some other states in the South. Again, you grew up in South Carolina. Uh, you cheer for the, the perennial doormat USC Gamecocks. Uh, it's been a rough century for USA football, but they're counting on the 22nd to be okay. We get it. Uh, but anyways, you guys, though, got a transfer, and this says a lot about what's happened to college football. Spencer Rattler was the vaunted OU uh, quarterback at the start of last season. He was getting all these licensing deals, making money from local car dealerships and, and whatnot. He was the man, Heisman shortlister at the start of last year. He loses his starting job midseason to a true freshman uh, from, by the way, from Washington, D.C., uh, Caleb Williams. Now, Spencer Rattler has transferred from Oklahoma to South Carolina, where he's playing quarterback, and Caleb Williams has left Oklahoma for, for USC. We're in kind of a new world here in college football because of the transfer rules in what's called NIL. If you haven't followed this, it's name, image, and licensing. The Supreme Court ruled basically that, that, that college kids can do endorsement deals now and get paid for it by using their name and their image, which has changed things dramatically. Those two factors have really changed the landscape in college ball, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to even the playing field. I hope it does because my team is a little bit of a doormat. Um, and college football is so ridiculous. And for a long time, I was sort of relieved to not care. You know, Clemson was winning all the time. That's South Carolina's big rival. Um, and now they've got me back. And I'm just like, oh, uh, why? And you know, so hope is this sort of uh, accelerant. And it's also pretty corrosive to people like me. Yeah. Um, but it, if, you're a, if you're a player, it's, we're at the very beginning stages of sort of retaking some of the power in this sport and it's obviously very polarizing because college football the coaches hate it right coaches hate it yeah. i mean a lot of fans hate it because you know this is supposed to be amateur sports and you get a free education and you know james might smack me here but i mean like this is a state where the the new uh, lsu football coach he makes twenty six thousand dollars a day every single day 
and just right up the road uh, in Baton Rouge, that's what a lot of people make in a year. And it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just like sort of how it is. And, you know, players are just beginning to get, I don't even know if it's a piece of the pie. It's just like a nibble of the pie. Because, yes, like Spencer Rattler makes some money, but the Oklahoma offensive line, they had an NIL deal in which they got free burritos right. last yes. year. <laughs> so not even money. Uh, the average NIL deal, deal is $500 per season. Right. Um, and so it's, it's interesting, and people really hate it because, I mean, it's not just about the education yeah. anymore, but it kind of never was. Yeah. Well, I want to thank the University of South Carolina for providing Dr. Tate with us. I our, our president, yeah, who's just great. terrific, was the provost in the University of South Carolina. And James, he, You've worked campaigns uh, in a lot of different states across the South, and you've also, I know, been to games uh, across the South. What, what other states do you think compare to LSU, I'm sorry, to Louisiana, in terms of just the total devotion to football, where it, 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 it is king, it's the only thing in town? Yeah. You've got to remember, we don't have a Auburn. We don't have a Clemson. Right. Okay. Great point. So LSU that, has LSU. That, There's no second school. Yeah. Probably Georgia. Right. Because Georgia Tech is a little bit like Tulane. I mean, it's in Georgia, but it's it's right. much less. It, I don't know if it's a, if I'm making sense, but it's a, right. it's a distinction with a difference. Yes. So there's no. Basically, the fan base is not in Alabama. They, it, I mean, they talk about Alabama, Auburn. You know, the Auburn people don't like Alabama. Right. Big surprise to anybody, to, to precisely no one. The a and people hate the Texas people. Right. And, and the class differences are barely below the surface there, too, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, state versus Ole Miss. I mean, if right. anybody knows Mississippi, right? Yeah, yeah they, 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 you know, they, they hate both. I mean, that's a big deal to them. But I'm just saying we have, um, unlike most people, and I think the, the school that most approximate that is the University of Georgia. Yeah. Jeff, you covered the Saints when they were pretty bad, and obviously you covered them when they, when they were fantastic. Um, take us back to their Super Bowl win, uh, and just like, has there ever been a, a moment in this city, on a non Mardi Gras <laughs> moment, where, where you saw this city is like so joyous, and, and it, that was a sort of me memorable, historic moment, right? Yeah, well, I always said the, the best way to have experienced that that game would be to cover the game, have been there in, in Miami to witness the event, and then to be rich enough to have a private jet and fly back and party in the French Quarter, because that's where the party was, right, back here. Uh, but no, it was, it was an incredible time. I remember sitting next to Peter Finney, again, I, br I bring him up, but he covered a lot of bad football, way worse than I did for decades, uh, back when they had astronauts as the general manager of the team. So I could only think of what it must have meant to Peter even though we're supposed to be impartial and objective, he's a native New Orleanian, and I knew what it meant for him to finally be at the top of the mountains and, and have a relevant team. I, James, you always use that word relevant, and that's what Sean Payton and Drew Brees did. They made the Saints relevant. They were the laughing stocks of the NFL, and, and this goes back actually to the bigger question of what we're talking about today, and I think the reason football is important here is because we want to be good. Yeah. Right. It's. I mean, we we pay our coaches more. Sean Payton was the second highest paid coach in the NFL behind Bill Belichick. Uh, we invest resources to be good. It's important. The state legislature has a very team friendly deal with the with the, with the New Orleans Saints to make them competitive, to put them in the top twelve in the league in operating income, when it's the second smallest, poorest market in the NFL. It's a small market. Yeah. It, it means a lot for the Saints to be good. It means a lot for LSU football to be good here. Now you can argue Coach o. right or wrong if that's our priorities are out of whack, but it's it's the truth. Coach O was 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 a hell of a you know marketing tool for the state, right? I mean Coach O, he sounded like South Louisiana, uh, certainly well s some parts of South Louisiana obviously. Yeah, right. Uh and some would say he even looked the part too. Um, he was a good marketing tool for the state, at least in some ways, obviously controversial, very controversial in other in other ways. But that speaks to what football can mean economically and culturally outside the region, right? You, you can sort of leverage these programs to get more kids to these schools, to sort of market uh, your institutions to a national audience, right? No doubt about it. And I, and I think I think we learned here, look, we don't, I hate to say it, but we, we don't have a lot of things we do well here, right? In this deep south, we're behind in education, I think business, so you could make arguments 
here in, in New Orleans that, you know, we always make the joke in Louisiana, we're 49th, thank God for Mississippi, right? That, <laughs> that we got them to keep us from the bottom, but we're good in football. It makes us feel good, right? That's one of the things we can, as Saints fans in New Orleans, we can say, look, we're, we're better than the Cowboys. We, this is something we can take pride in, in our state and in our city that keeps us up in the major leagues. And I don't think we have too many things like that. I think culturally, yeah. our, our entertainment industry, uh, that certainly is, yeah. a, is a source of pride. Our the food and cooking. Do you catch things like that? Saints fans when you're tough on them, or is it more like, yeah, you know what? I'm frustrated too. They they keep losing. This this is annoying. Or like, what's the what's the reaction? No, they don't want to hear it's going to rain. Yeah, like I said, I mean, it's, uh, it's I wanna, tough. So I want to get to Q and A here, but I also want to ask an important question for all three of you. Best football game in the South, college, pro, or high school that you personally witnessed start with Kent oh man in the south yeah um it wasn't it, it was two southern teams it was Auburn and Florida State in the national championship but it was played in Los Angeles yeah but I'll count it um that was an amazing game when Florida State won the national championship with uh, Jameis Winston and Auburn should have won it didn't just uh a spectacular game and nobody ever weeps for the sports writer on deadline but oh my god that was hard to write <laughs> those who cover politics do weep and i can a point of personal privilege as they say in the senate uh try covering the first debate between trump and biden in the fall of 20 on deadline if you all remember that debate where biden said would you shut up man <laughs> Try covering that sucker on deadline, okay? Uh, anyways, I digress, I digress for, for best bet. James, best game you saw in the South. LSU, Florida, 2007. We went for it like four or five times on fourth down, Jacob Hester, and then the announcer announced in Stanford, an unheard of, upset Southern Cal. Oh, and Tebow was in, 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 in Tebow was there. It, it was, and I'll tell you one other thing about it, and, and we talked about this. The sports... The Washington Post sports page in the 80s and the early 90s was the stuff of legend. Yes. Okay. I mean, they had Tony Kendrick Kornheiser. Boswell, Kornheiser, Will Bond, Will Bond yeah. Mark Maskey. Uh, no. George Solomon was the editor. Yes. Who are, became friendly with. We'd have lunch at the park. He said the single best sports writer we ever had was John Ed Bradley. Oh, interesting. Who wrote maybe the best football book ever written called it Never Rains in Tiger Stadium. Yeah. And I got, John, it's all about how traumatized he was. And he stays in Opelousas. He's kind of, huh? Captain of the LSU team. Yeah, the captain of the team. And I got him, we were, I was doing that serious XM thing, and we did it from there. And I got him to come and do the yeah. radio show, but he would not go in the stadium. <laughs> and, you, and literally, it, 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 it's, it's, it's literature. It's a, and his daddy was like a high school football coach. George said, John Ed is the single most talented sports writer to ever come through here. James, were you in Tiger Stadium on Halloween of 59? When I was in the same seat that my sister's in. <laughs> so and Billy you got to look at the run. Billy Can the J.C. Polites. So Billy Cannon returned the punt to beat Ole Miss on Halloween night, 59. When Billy Cannon, of course, was the last fellow to win the Heisman at LSU until... Our favorite Ohioan came down here and uh, and won it in 2019. Uh, Jeff, your favorite football game that you saw up close in the South, any level? Uh, easy. It's the uh, dome coming game, 2006, the reopening of the dome. I don't know how many how many people were there. Yeah, pretty epic, right? And and the thing that was special for me, you know, I had the assignment, the A1 assignment to write, really not on the game but the event, right? So I, I remember being outside and seeing all the music. Actually, the night before was incredible. I, I somehow got into the dome for the rehearsal with U2 and Green Day. Uh, they did the, the pregame music, which was just unbelievable. It was a Super Bowl. You go to Super Bowls and don't have as big a musical acts as we had for this third week of the season, Monday night game. And, that, and you have to give the NFL credit. I know a lot of people don't ever want to give the NFL credit, but they did for that game. I mean, they gave that story a global platform, the biggest platform we have, Monday Night Football. But the fact that Steve Gleason blocked the punt and had that moment, a guy that understood what it meant. I mean, he married a New Orleans girl. He lived in Uptown. He was one of the few players that kind of got New Orleans early on. And he knew right away what he'd done. And that was just 
a, a special moment I'll never forget. Paul Varisco's daughter. And uh, do you want to mention something about Buck Leeson and you? So J Jeff just wrote a great column uh, because he marched in a Mardi Gras parade with Steve Gleason, um, a part of the crew pushing Steve Gleason in his wheelchair down St. Charles Avenue um, two weeks ago at Mardi Gras. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Uh, you know, he's a beloved figure. Sure. I know you all know. Uh, and look, Drew Brees, most incredible player I've ever covered, but the most inspiring was Steve. I should have mentioned far. Katrina earlier because I, I, I'm now reminded of something that James said in the days after Katrina, and obviously – uh, city faced its, its, its gravest crisis, and there was talk about canceling the rest of the year for LSU football. I think James went ballistic, right? I mean, I, like, all of you have seen James on TV, and he's usually sort of subtle and kind of retiring on TV. You can't tell how he feels about like Donald Trump or anything. But J James, I think, was at his most emphatic in September of 2005 when there was talk about, you know, maybe we'll just cancel the rest of the year for LSU. James, remember that? What did you say? Oh, yeah, I remember it well. And, and, and that taken in, I don't know how many people, I mean, forget, like the PMAC was like full the uh, Pete of, 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 of arena people. Pete Maravich arena in Baton Rouge. You, 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 you know, but Roosevelt made him play baseball in World War II. Right. All right? If, if, if you don't do this, you, you, you've lost. Yeah. I mean, for whatever it is, and I, I remember we played Arizona State out there. And, uh, what was his name? The guy from St. Martinville. I loved his name. That made that big catch. I'll think of it. But I was, you know, it, it was, I was in Washington. It was vital for the city to have that. Huh? It was vital for the city to have that diversion. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it needed to, you know, and then the Saints coming back in that 2006. I mean, it, 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 it I, I don't, like people in, in Washington and New York, you know, I, I don't get the whole thing. Well, I can't explain it to you. I just, just forget about it. You, you know, you, you, that reminds you, me. You, you just don't know, uh, and I'm not, I don't have. of fish out of water, I was reminded of this last night, actually. During the Bush administration, if I can bring back the politics for a fast second, Condi Rice was Secretary of State. And as you know, Condi Rice grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. She's a devoted Bama football fan. Condoleezza Rice had Jack Straw who was the foreign secretary of the Blair government at the time in the UK, come to America. But when he came to America, they, 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 there was no event in Washington. She brought Jack Straw to the field at Bryant-Denny Stadium and showed Jack, Jack Straw an, an Alabama football game to explain to him American culture and folkways. Um, and can you imagine, like, you're a member of parliament, you're the foreign secretary, and, like, you know, went to Eton or Harrow, like one of those fancy schools in, in the UK. Like, the next thing you know, you're standing on the field uh, at Bryant Denny with like 90,000 fans for a college. It's just like, I'm sorry. But that image of Condi Rice and Jack Straw to me is just like one of the enduring memories uh, of, uh, of uh, the South and football. Let, let's do some Q&A here. Uh, John Barry, the great John Barry at the mic. Okay. Th thank you for the plug. Uh, James, but I want, I'll tell you one story. Buy his book on the 1918 okay. uh, pandemic. Well, after I, Lloyd Carr, the former Michigan coach, is a, is a good friend of mine. And after I finished the 1918 book, I had felt that I had been in a tunnel for seven years and I want to get outside. So I was considering writing a book about Michigan football. And I spent a couple of weeks at spring practice. This was the well, I'll skip that part. Here's the important point. 100, you know, biggest stadium in the country, sold out every year, huge game, obviously, with Ohio State every year. And we were talking about football, and, you know, he knew, of course, that I'd coach Tulane against LSU, and I was talking about the crowd at Michigan Stadium, and he's saying, yeah, but those guys, those guys in the South, they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> They're not like we are up here. Uh, so that was uh, the one story. But I want to ask a serious question. We all know the LSU library is falling apart, decrepit, leaks. Okay, they've got the money. They can build, okay, build I'm glad. The James no, nonetheless, the amount of money that coaches make yeah, here we go. is so incredibly obscene. How do you correct that? How do you place a limit on it? How do you, and, and devote those resources into an area where it should be spent? I, uh, so 
I think this is direct. Tough but fair. So I'll tell you a story about Michigan football. In 1992, we had the first debate was in Lansing. And the way it works, you go to, or maybe it was the second debate, you go to a city near that you prepare and then you drive that morning to the debate. So we had prep in Ypsilanti, which is between Detroit and Ann Arbor. And I'm a runner, and of course I wasn't prepared for the fall weather in Michigan, so I went in a sundry shop and I bought a sweatshirt. It was obviously the University of Michigan sweatshirt. I didn't think twice about it. So the next day, we drive to Lansing. So I go out to take my run, and you know, they have a whole thousand people outside the hotel. And I walked out there with a Michigan sweatshirt, big error, big error. They ran me back in that hotel so fast. I mean, if you think that we're the only people that know how to hate in college football, no. They know how to hate Michigan. You know, we'll pay the librarian that kind of money when somebody pays $8,000 to go to the library. But when people are paying that and people are sponsoring it, it will sell 70,000 season tickets. Now, in, by, by the way, you could make an argument that we get free rent because the, the stadium is on, on state property, but none of, no money is diverted from the philosophy professor to the football coach. Can you that want to take on there? It's just gonna get more and more now that Texas and Oklahoma have come in. It, 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 it's an arms race. It just, it's just there's, there's no stopping. It's an arms race. And if you want to be in the arms race, you got to supply them with stingers and javelins and, you know, and everything else. There's, just, there's no getting around it. I mean, you can. Arch it brought in $100, $100 million last year, LSU football. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, Ken, that's I problem. wrote a fantastic story about two months ago about how much money LSU spent on Brian Kelly and uh, sort of use that to talk about um, Baton Rouge and uh, the quality of life there and just sort of the contrast between his payday and the rest of that community. I mean, it, for better or worse, it's just what it costs. If you really want to compete, that's what it costs. And you can either decide to say, all right, we're just not going to compete yeah. anymore and not going to try for championships, or you can pay your coach 10, 12, 15, 20 million dollars a year, right? It's, it's such a nuanced yeah. thing, and it's frustrating, and there's, you know, I, parts of me wishes that my team would, would spend like that. Part of me is glad it doesn't. Um, I think if we just stop thinking of college sports as a sort of, like, pious, innocent, pure sporting realm, and it's more, I mean, and, and more like the corporate entity that it that actually is, and also the fact that a lot of times these football programs are less football than they are marketing. So I know about LSU, where I live, and, but I know because of the football. I, I recognize the logo. I mean, it's, yeah. so it's, it's not just the equipment, it's not just the players, it's not just the recruiting. They, they, the, these universities justify it by saying, well, it's, brand, it's a brand, and that's what you're also paying for I like it some days and I hate it others. Yes, ma'am. I wonder what you guys think about the um, prohibition. Uh, UNO was not allowed to have a football program as part of their, you know, being able to exist. And um, I know I, I, I got my PhD there and I, shoot, I went there first time in 87 and I got back there in 2007. And um, a lot of people are really bitter about that. You know, like if we had a football team, we'd be competitive, we'd be recruiting, you know, better people academically. What do you guys think about that? Football's also really, really expensive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's for, I mean, I don't know the, <clears throat> the dollars and cents that we're talking about LSU here, but um, for the $100 million that LSU brought in last year, um, the profit is not gigantic. I mean, part of it is they just sort of keep pouring money into facilities and things like that, coaching salaries. Um, but it's really, really expensive. Um, but again, I mean, it's, it's sort of advertising. Sure. Um, yeah. I think they're actually trying to start football. Really? Yes. I mean, they're going to have a, a big push right now. Tim Duncan, the athletic director, the president, is a former football player, right, at Bucknell. And they will have a student um, fee referendum, or an increase to pay for it. Like Kent said, it's expensive. There's, so it's going to fall on the students' backs. And I if they don't vote it in. I should start reading my uh, alumni so newsletter then. Right? Jeff, 
just yeah. wrote a story on NOLA.com about the Nichols UNO basketball game. Yeah. I, I highly recommend it. I mean, you, we think of all the sports as Alabama and Georgia, LSU and A&M. I mean, that, and what you covered at, at Carr. I mean, the depth of this is just unbelievable. I, I, I got to point out, I have my Tulane gear because I spent nine years teaching at Tulane, which coincidentally is the exact amount of time it took me to get out of undergraduate school at LSU. <laughs> 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 On that note, <laughs> I, mean, I think we got a, a prominent questioner coming up here somewhere. <laughs> James, would you comment on this? Uh, Joe Dean years ago discontinued a hundred year old rivalry between Tulane and LSU. I, you know, oh boy. I, I, oh boy. I think that the mentality was if they beat us, it'll hurt us in recruiting. Okay? I, I, I I wish I would have stayed in the SEC. I mean, I know there were reasons that Vanderbilt, you know, got the crap beat out of them and cashed a check. <laughs> All right. I, I, but I, I, and now the legislature, if you notice, every year they play McNeese, they play in Southern. Yeah. All right. They play Louisiana <clears throat> Tech. The legislature has, that's actually a political move where they would go and try to get more funding, and the legislature from Ruston says, well, you got to play us. You know, we plan so that's a million dollars. They got yeah. two million. And I, I think it causes some mismatches. All right, I, I do. But I, I would be all for us playing, you know, every year. So the finance is a hard bill to make up. You know, because if you don't have the home game, everything in Baton Rouge, the merchants, everything is attuned yeah. to having this many games. And they had to put up a lot of money to get us to play Florida State in the Dome. If they don't, Alabama Auburn stop playing at Legion Field on yeah. neutral sites. Neutral, Jerry Jones has the money to do that. Yeah. But I, I would like to see us play Tulane, you know, like early in the season in yeah. September when it's really slow down here, when the, yeah. you know, the, the restaurants are empty and the emergency help. But I, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, well, I think if you went on TV and you went on TV – and talked about it. There we go. Get it started again. There we go. On that note about reviving the Tulane LSU rivalry, I want to say thank you. And just real fast before you go, uh, Kent's book is called Across the River. Uh, buy it today uh, at your local bookstore or wherever you buy books. Uh, Jeff Duncan has a, a lot of books out that you should read and may have one coming soon that you should keep your eye on. And James has also written uh, quite a few books, but I don't think you've done yet one about sports, James. So that could be your next, your next I, book. Yeah, I don't know, man. At my age, I'm just. <laughs> but I'll, I'll be watching the games. And thanks, y'all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.